Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Um, today I'm going to take a look at two puzzles um, which have been requested by a new subscriber to the channel. Um, he's been solving uh, tough Sudoku puzzles, I think, only for a, a brief amount of time. He seems to make very good progress though. And he asked a question about how to make uh, a further deduction from this pattern that you can see on the screen. I'm going to talk a bit about how to do that. And then we had a follow-up exchange of emails where uh, a similar uh, pattern actually arose uh, from the same app again. So um, obviously the app likes this technique that we're going to discuss, uh, which is a skyscraper technique. So that's the name of, of what we're going to be looking at today. And I'm going to be talking a bit about it in the context of the similarity between a skyscraper and another type of technique that we've covered on the channel before and that is the X-Wing uh, and in particular the so-called sashimi finned X-Wing. Now in fact when you think about it, when you understand what both of these techniques uh, are, there is a, an exact equivalence really between a skyscraper and the sashimi finned X-Wing and they, the skyscraper actually is a representation of two sashimi finned x-wings in the same puzzle and I'm going to show you why I think that's true in a moment. Um, if you do, um, if you're watching these videos and think gosh I've got a really tough puzzle I'd like to understand how to make progress with then just um, you can email them to us at uh, crackingthecryptic at gmail.com or tweet them, just tweet a, a photograph of the puzzle to uh, at cryptic cracking and if we have time we'll, we'll do our best to show you how to solve it. Now as you can see, I've, I've populated this grid with all of the possibles in the empty squares. So do take a stare at it and see if you can spot uh, how to make progress. And the key is to focus on the number three. And in fact, there are a couple of ways of looking at threes, but I want to look at them in, in columns here. And I want to notice that first, if we look at column six, you can see there's only two positions that we can place a three in column six, and that's in this square and this square. Now if you discover this sort of thing it's important, if, especially if you're stuck on a puzzle, that you you hunt around for similar restrictions in other columns. So always bear in mind we're trying to duplicate the, the position that we have in columns or rows. So once we identify that a number can only go into two positions in columns we need to look at other columns for a similar restriction. Now here if we look at column 9, you can see we almost have a match. We have a 3 here and a 3 up here. So this 3 is matching the 3 here in row 8. But this 3 is slightly removed from the 3 here, which is in row 3, and this one obviously being in row 2. But the fact that there are only two positions for these 3s and that they are linked in one row is enough for us to make further progress because let's think about how these threes can be arranged and the, and the key to this is to consider the threes down here because obviously only one of these threes can be true. So option one would be that this three is true. Now if this three is true we can say with certainty that this three must also be true. Now Similarly, or the corollary of that, is that if this 3 is true, we can say with certainty that this 3 is true. So what we need to do now is to hunt around the grid and identify if there are any squares that, uh, that see both of those arrangements. And probably the simplest way to do that is to compare. The, we, we know that either this will be a 3 or this will be a 3. So are there any squares in the grid that see this square and this square? Because if there are, they can't contain threes. Now, the two obvious candidates here are this square, which sees this square because it's in the same row, and this square because it's in the same 3x3 three three block, and this square here, which obviously is in the same block as this one, and the same row as this one. So we, what we'd be able to do is to remove a 3 from both of these squares and you can see immediately the puzzle completely collapses now. Um, but I just want to spend a moment on 
discussing, I mean, this, this skyscraper technique, it's so cool because if we, I'll, I'll do some highlighting, but it effectively it looks a bit like a tower, especially when the skyscraper shape is in the columns of the grid. Um, but there is a similarity here between this pattern and the sashimi fin neck swing. So let's just remind ourselves what a sashimi fin neck swing is. Now an X swing would be if this square here uh, wasn't filled but had the possibility of being a three. So let's, um, maybe I, I'm not actually going to put it in, but you could see then we would have a box of threes like this. Let's remove the three from that square. So if we had a three as a possible for this square here, we would have a straightforward X swing. And we'd be able to do logic a bit like the logic we just did. So we would know that there would be a binary choice in terms of either this would be a three or this would be a three. And the effect of that would be to create threes across these diagonals. And why does that matter? Well, that would allow us to look down row three and row uh, row 8 here and eliminate any other 3's we could find because we would know that one of these 3's must be true and one of these 3's must be true. Now the reason that the, the X-wing here is called sashimi is because one of the corners of the X-wing actually is already filled with a number and you can clearly see we've got a massive 7 here so this square here can't be a 3 so you might immediately think, well, I can't use that X-wing logic on the puzzle. But actually, in this case, we can. Because this square here is a so-called fin from the basic X-wing. So the basic X-wing is here. And this fin sticks out. And what that means we can do is we can do the following logic we can say either the fin is true. Now, if the th fin is true, this square here will be a 3. Or the fin is not true. Now, if the fin is not true, we know this square here must be a 3. And if that's true, we know that the diagonal cell here must be a 3. In which case, we can then hunt for squares in the grid that see this square and this square and eliminate the threes from them. So we get to the same result by considering the sashimi fin x wing that exists around here. But interestingly, it's perfectly possible also to view this sashimi fin x wing as existing in a different place in the grid. So just to check that you understand, have a look at the grid now and see if you can see a second sashimi fin deck swing on the number three and you should immediately focus on this square where again we've got this square pattern around the grid of threes where this square this corner of the x-wing is already taken up this makes it a sashimi fin deck swing because next to the seven in the same column is this possible possibility of this being a 3 and again that allows us to run the same logic we now know either this is a 3 or we can say with certainty the sort of x-wing is true and these two squares will be 3's and therefore again we can hunt around the grid for squares and see this one and this one and we get to the same answer so in fact the basic skyscraper pattern is the equivalent of two sashimi fin neck swings um, and I thought that was quite an interesting thing to note. Now Mark followed up this video or his, his request uh, for an email with this puzzle and you can hopefully see you know we've reached a similar point in the solve i.e. there's you know there's an awful lot of good work that's been done um, you know an awful lot of place numbers and we're just left with the end game so to speak we've got to spot what the clever trick is to um, uh, to take us forward from this position. Now here, do take a look at the puzzle. I, I'll tell you, I mean, that there are actually a couple of ways of solving this puzzle from this point, but I want us to fo focus on the skyscraper technique. So do take a look at it, see if you can see where the skyscraper might exist. Or, if you're not happy with the skyscraper terminology, have a look and see if you can see where sashimi fin deck swings uh, exist. 
And I'm going to tell you that here we can have a look at um, the number four. So that's where we need to, to focus our attention in, in this case. So have a look at the number four and see if you can see a spot where we might need to look. And the place I would look, if we look down column one here, uh, we've got rather a squatter skyscraper, I suppose. It's not got much height to it, this one. Um, if we look here, we've just got two positions for fours. So immediately we ask ourselves the question, OK, can I find other columns where the fours are restricted to just two positions? Um, well, you might say, well, how about this uh, column three? Well, column three would be useful, except neither of the fours in column three are in the same row as the, what, the fours we found in column one. Now, we need at least one of them to match up. So column three is not going to be any use. Um, now, column seven we could actually look at because um, uh, this is a form of an X-wing. Um, but I don't want to cover it here because this is, um, uh, I, I want to actually look over one further because I think it's slightly easier to see. Maybe we'll revisit um, uh, column seven in a minute. But here you can see we have an equivalence in this square and this square between the fours. And here we've got nothing. So the basic X-wing is, is broken by this nine, but we have this square where the second four in column nine appears. That gives us the squat shaped skyscraper and allows us to perform the same logic as before, i.e. we know that either this must be a four or this must be a four, and therefore we can hunt in the grid for squares that see both of these cells. Oops. And the obvious candidate here would be this one. Now, let's just take a quick look at column seven, just to make sure that we are, we're understanding the logic. Now here, we don't have uh, a sashimi finned X-wing because in this square here, the four is still a candidate, it's still possible. So we still have an X-wing type arrangement. The thing that breaks the X-wing here is this cell. Now this cell is a fin to the basic X-wing that we have here. And that allows us to do similar logic to the one we were doing with the sashimi fin X wing. So we can either say with certainty that this cell is a four. If this cell is a four, that's one possibility. If this cell is not a four, then we definitely do have an X wing here. And what we could do then is we could eliminate from row six and row seven any other fours that we could find. So we know that either this is a four, or we can eliminate fours from, for example, from this square. Now, the great thing about this, as you'll have immediately noticed, is that either way round, we get to eliminate this four, because if this is the real four, if the fin is true, we eliminate this four. If the fin is not true, we have an X-wing, and that allows us to eliminate this four. So either way round, this square here would be a seven. And you can see, hopefully, get we get to the same position if we think about the skyscraper type puzzle or, or arrangement. What we'd be able to do in that case um, is to look at this square and we would know with certainty this square can be a four. This would have to therefore be a seven and the effect of this being a seven is of course that this is a seven. So we get to the same point and I'll just throw it out there for good measure. There is also a way of cracking this puzzle using quite a nice piece of uniqueness logic and so do take a look at it and see if you can spot where it's it's a bit more complicated than standard uniqueness but it's still rather rather pretty and worth bearing in mind when you get to these sorts of end games and the key here is to focus actually on this square and ask ourselves the question is it possible that this square contains a one or a two and, and it's not and that's because of the way that this square interacts with this square, this square, this square, this square, and this square. Um, now, if this square could only be a one or a two, then in the finished solution, 
we would have, we've got a problem because these six squares in question form their own puzzle. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that they are totally independent of the entirety of the rest of the grid. They don't have any effect on any cell in the whole of the rest of the grid and we can see that by selecting options. For example, let's imagine that in the finished solution this square here was a 1. Now what's the effect of that? Well, this would be a 1, this would be a 2, this would be a 3, this would be a 2, this would be a 1, and this would be a 3. Now the problem with that is that there is no way of disambiguating that potential solution from the situation where this was a 2. Because if this is a 2, it doesn't affect any other cells. Uh, just to clear that up, if this is a Obviously, if this is a 1, 2 here, we have a 1, 2 pair in this box. So this square here would have to be a 7. That, that, that's forced. So let's think about what, what happens if this is a 2. Let's see if this has an effect on any other cell in the grid other than the six square, squares in question. So this is a 2. Therefore, this is a 1. This is a 3. This is a 1. This is a 2, and this is a 3, and you can see again that has had no effect on anything else in the grid, because in each of the affected rows here, these numbers form pairs that don't affect anything else. In their boxes, they form pairs, and in their columns, they form a triple. Um, but it clearly is a sort of uh, a mutually dependent triple that has no effect outside of the three squares in question. So actually there would be another way of cracking this puzzle which is simply to take a look at it and write in a seven there. Because this, this cell cannot be a one or a two because if it is we look at the finished solution and we'd be able to say that the puzzle was not unique. Now we know good puzzles are unique and therefore we'd be able to disregard uh, that possibility or those possibilities from the finished solution. So that's enough of me waffling on. It's a bit of, I suppose, technical theory today, um, but um, by reference to two practical examples. So I hope you've got something out of um, listening to me talk through those examples. And if you do enjoy the channel, please subscribe. We really appreciate it. If any of you are in a position to do so, you can sponsor us on Patreon as well. If you go to Patreon and type in Cracking the Cryptic, you can see our site there. And as we reach milestones in terms of patron, patrons, um, we're going to show extra videos um, of uh, Japanese handcrafted Sudoku puzzles, which in my opinion are about the best out there. So some of you may be in a position to do that, and we'd really appreciate it if you can. Otherwise, we're back again, another edition tomorrow, Cracking the Cryptic.